good to see you. If you're, welcome, if you're joining us online, we want to welcome you. We're glad that you've chosen Vineyard to be part of your worship experience, your spiritual journey. We certainly count it as an honor, as a privilege. Uh, we are in a series we just started last week. You asked for it. What we do is, is that on Easter, because that's a pretty, usually pretty well attended service, is we um, do a survey and we say, what do you want to hear from us about? And then we take the top list of that. One of those was about the subject of faith. How do I uh, increase my faith? How do I have more faith? The good news with that is, is God actually wants you to have more faith. So by asking that question, you're... You're on, you're, you're, on the right, you're on the right track. You're, you're, you're on the same page with God. He wants you to grow in faith. And the reason is because faith is the active ingredient. Kind of what lithium ion is to a Tesla. Faith is to your Christianity, to, your, to, to, to how you walk out being a Christ follower. So it's super important. And you want to grow in that area because... Uh, it's, it, it, it makes all the difference. Now, everybody has faith. Every, you may, I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but even, even an atheist has faith. It's just what you, how much of it and how what you put it into. I mean, and, and so growing in our faith in what God can do, we believe in God, we trust God, we, we believe in the miraculous, <clears throat> the, those things start to uh, to increase. So how do you grow in faith? Well, it, par, part of it is just you need an injection of faith by going to God's Word. The Bible says faith comes. Well, that's what we're talking about. How do we grow in our faith? How do we increase? How does it come more into my life? By hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. And so that's, a, that's part of the way. Now, certainly it's a journey of growing and learning to trust in God. But let's look at that, how you uh, kind of map out that journey for your life. Eight attributes of faith. Let's look first at that. What, what does faith do? Why, why, do I, why is it worth it? Because there's always something, you know, to grow in something, you have to give up something else. There's a certain level of sacrifice. Well, one is, is it ter- determines what God can do in my life. Faith determines. In other words, the choice really becomes yours on how much God moves in your life. Jesus is the one who said that. He said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. So you get to choose. God has over 7,000 promises in the Bible. So you get to choose how, how many of those blessings happen and are unlocked in your life for your business, for your, for your job, for your school, your education, for your family, for your relationships, for your marriage, all of those things, it, you get to choose because it's according to your faith. Also, faith can solve impossible problems. When we're facing like what feels basically an impossible problem, faith is the key element that you need. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, Jesus said, nothing will be impossible for you. In Palestine, mustard seeds are the smallest seed. He's saying something as small as that can grow into something quite large. Jesus is having us focus not on, he's he's not on really how big our faith is, but he's saying, hey, just the smallest amount put in a big God has big results. And you know what that does? That tends to grow our faith. We think, wow, it's really not how big my faith is. It's, It's what I put it in. You know, I can have small faith, but put in a big God, huge results. Number three, faith is the key to answered prayer. So if you pray, which I would hope you do, but if you pray, I think all of us are on the same page. We want answers, right? We, we, we want it to make a difference. We don't want to just be talking to the air. Faith is the, the, the differential He says, if you believe, you will receive whatever you ask in prayer. Well, that, I think all of us would even pray more, however much you pray. We would pray more if we knew we would get whatever we asked for. I mean, that's going to be like, wow, I didn't, I mean, I was hoping for it to get a little better, you know. 
What's the difference? Faith. Faith. You know, I used to pray when I first became a Christ follower. I used to, you know, pray, you know, dear sir, if you're not too busy and if you don't have too much on your plate right now, you know, just give me a morsel. That's not what the Bible teaches. It says you go into it with faith. It, it's, faith is the secret to achievement. In other words, things that are going to really make a difference in our lives, our purpose that we're giving our lives to, everything is possible for the person who believes. And so your dreams can become reality when you add faith to it. It gives you the confidence to get off a dead center, to keep moving. When you get uh, pushed back, you press forward. Venner, uh, uh, Venner Braun, von Braun, the guy who... Uh, uh, Warner von Braun, the guy who was helped with the rockets uh, get us to the moon, he said there has never been a single great achievement in history without faith. And at the time, I mean, that seemed pretty impossible to land people on the moon and get them back safely again. He helped make that happen. It's the basis for miracles. So you need a miracle in your life. You want to see a something miraculous happen in somebody you care about, a loved one, a situation. How does that happen? Well, again, faith is the key. Anyone who has faith in me, Jesus says, will do whatever I've been doing, even greater things. Now that's, I remember when I first read that, I had first be, I'd become a Christ follower. I was reading through the book of John, and I read that, and I remember how that hit me when I read that for the first time, that Jesus said something even greater. We can do things greater than him. Now, I know uh, subsequently, you know, I've read, you know, the commentators, and they said, well, it's because of, you know, Christ followers all over the world when they pray, more miracles are happening than Jesus. But that's not the way it sounded when I read it. I just thought, Man, he's really entrusting me with a lot. I don't, know, I don't know if he knew who he's talking to here, you know. But it was just such a profound sense of empowerment. Like, wow, he's like, giving me the keys to the kingdom to like go forth and conquer and do something great for me in my name. That's how it struck me. You know what? I think it's true. It's true. And it's true also that Christians are praying all over the world and great things are happening. But it, God, he says, you can make a difference in prayer and do, do the things that Jesus did. Uh, lack of, now I don't know if you realize this, but the lack of faith, the Bible says, is sin. He says everything that does not come from faith is sin. The only reason I'm pointing that out is I think sometimes we think our lack of faith is like a weakness. Like, ah, it's just, you know, I'm just not good at that. You know, like we had such amazing singers this morning and I was chatting with somebody and they were going, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not really good at singing. So I can make a joyful noise, you know, I'm good at that. But that's kind of like a weakness. That's not really my gift mix. You know, that's faith. That's, that's not what faith is about. It's actually to not have faith is actually wrong. It's like, well, that's why he says it's sin. It's, it's something you can correct. It's not like, oh, I'm just not gifted at that. No, you can step into that and say, I'm going to choose to have more faith in my life. I'm going to there's a choice factor. According to your faith, Jesus said, it'll be done unto you. It's, it's not just a weakness. It's what you're expecting God to do in your life. And then number seven, it's the way to please God. If you're a Christ follower and you, have, you, you believe in you know, your heavenly father, you want, you want a relationship that's where it's, it's pleasing to him. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So Faith is an attribute that pleases God. Just like a parent, if you're a parent and, and your kids, you know, trust you, that pleases you. Well, even more so with God, because we're obviously uh, imperfect. God is perfect. So when we trust in a perfect God, it's a way of pleasing God. And then number eight is it produces success in living in all areas of life. The victory that overcomes the world, I'd want to know that. I want victory that overcomes the world. It's, it's in faith. It gives you confidence. It neutralizes fears that sometimes would lock us up and keep us from, 
from moving forward. Think of like Moses and Aaron. You know, they're, you know they've led the people out of, out of bondage, but they haven't gone through the Red Sea yet. It's just a sea. There's no opening. And in pursuit is Pharaoh's armies. They're in a crucible. It's just like, oh, my, I'm getting it from all sides. I'm blocked here. Pharaoh's are. And if you know, Siri's talking to me. <laughs> and, if you, and if you know the story, God creates a distraction there. <laughs> just like I had my distraction. And opens up the Red Sea. Just having that confidence. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I, don't, I mean, we don't really know if Moses knew all the things that were going to happen there. He was just in a tight spot. But he had faith. And you just, I believe God is going to come through in this situation. So eight ways. Let's look at what is faith, how to implement your faith. One is, is by stretching your imagination. God gives you, that's a gift, by the way, the, the ability to imagine. I don't, as far as we know, animals don't have that capacity. You have been given that capacity because it's a God inbred thing where you can imagine something that is not true but could be true. God is able to do more than you think. Now we understand that. But also imagine. You, and God wants us to begin with that concept, something, an idea, a dream. Uh, yesterday I went to the, to the air show, or at least tried to go to the air show. Hour and a half, two hours to get in. I went with my son, my daughter-in-law, and my, my she's going to turn one this coming week, Lily. I don't know why we thought that was a good idea. If you, want, if you don't know, don't bring a one-year-old to an air show. They don't like it. So we finally get out there. First jet, she's screaming. We thought, oh, we got to go. And then we spent the rest of the day trying to get out. It was like two and a half hours to get out. So it's not what I imagined, you know. But part of the reason I love air shows is I went to one years ago. I think I was, I don't know, 21 or 22. I had, and I, I don't remember going to one before that. And it was out in Arizona. It was, a, it was the Thunderbirds with the Air Force. I went, and I went and saw the air show, got right up on the... I mean, incredible, you know, I was just standing right there because I actually went the day before with a journalist friend of mine and watched him do all these incredible stunts for the photographers. And I just thought, I got I to gotta, I gotta fly. I, and it inspired me so much. I, I signed up to become a pilot, got my pilot's license, and uh, I started flying. And it began with an image, a dream. I saw it. I thought, wow. I, now, I didn't, you know, do all the stuff that jets can do, but... I got in the air, and in Genesis 15, we see God doing the same thing with Abraham. Abraham's 100. His wife Sarah's 90. God says, I'm going to give you a, child, a son, and, and, and it's, going to be for, it's going to be a work. And he didn't believe it. He goes, I don't know. How is this going to work? In fact, he goes, I'm going to give you, through your son, I'm going to create a nation. Again, Abraham just like couldn't get his, his, his mind around it. So he goes, I'm going to give you a picture. He goes, look up in the sky. The Lord took Abraham, his name, he called him Abram at the time, outside and said, look at the heavens. What is he doing? He's casting a vision. He's giving him a dream. Every time he walks outside, he's going to go, oh yeah, I remember God said something about the heavens. He goes, count, try to count them if you, you know, if you can count them. So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. And then out of that became the Jewish nation. But during that season when it wasn't a reality yet, Abraham, every time he looked out, he had that picture. He had a vision. He had a dream he was moving for. Well, when I, after I got my pilot's license, I, I came here to go to school. And God had given me a vision for a church, to plant a church. Start a church from scratch. And so when I met Sharon, uh, we were dating, and, and I pitched to her my vision. I said, God gave me this vision to do a church plant. And, you know, that's, that's what I want us to do, with, you know, in our life together. 
And, and, and she was excited about it. I took her in my plane. I, rented, I was just renting planes. So I took her on a plane. We flew all around Hampton Roads. And I said, see all those thousands of houses? That's, that's God, God's going to do something in the lives of those people. There's people that have marriage problems. And some are on the brink of divorce or have gone through a divorce. And they're in all that, you know, the, the pain from that. And there's people that have addictions and and, uh, and all kinds of confusion with, in, in their life and what their purpose. And so many of them haven't even, don't even have a relationship with Jesus. And we would just like pray. We'd go and fly over and we together we'd just pray over the houses. And that God was going to do something. And then if you know the story of Vineyard, we started this church out of our home and moved to some school, Cinema Cafe. We ended up buying... Uh, the the uh, the Jim Strata converted and that well that's the building but this is the church and it started with a vision you know and and God wants to give you a vision to expand your imagination faith is also taking the initiative instead of just keeping it in the dream phase you start walking forward this is a great example of this in Mark chapter five. Jesus is going around, you know, ministering to people. And there's this lady that has a issue of blood for 12 years. Well, in the Jewish custom, what that meant was is you were ceremonial unclean, which what that meant was you could not really integrate in with other people. Uh, you couldn't be part of crowds. You were isolated. And so she hears about Jesus and she so at one point, she decides, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go try to see him. That gets, and that, that was an act of faith. And then she sees all these crowds, and she knows she's not supposed to be close to people. She's been told that. She's been shunned. She pushes her way through the, the crowds in order to touch Jesus. And then she ends up getting healed. Now, G Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. But when at first, before he says this, he goes, who touched me? And Peter, who often says, you know, crazy things. He's like, you know, the Patrick Starr, the, the, the Barney Fife, you know, the kind of like, does weird things, you know. He's, he goes, well, how, you know, Jesus, look at all these people. How, how I, everybody's touching you. But this, he was talking about this lady and he goes, no, no, there's something, there's something that just happened. There was, there was an interchange of faith. And faith will give you the kind of initiative that that, that that woman had, who ended up getting healed, stepped out of her place where she felt trapped and, and, and silenced and, and quarantined into a place where she could initiate her faith and experience wholeness and healing. Faith is also risking a failure. This is the great tension. Right? We want to, a lot of times God tells us to do things that look, square, that look weird, that look squirrely. People are like, oh, you're a weirdo. And so this becomes a challenge for us, right? Uh, it's a challenge for us here at Vineyard when we have our services. We want to operate in faith. And sometimes that causes us to do things that the world would look at it and go, that's a little weird, you know. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we want we want to uphold excellence and we want to recognize that there's people here that 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 uh, uh, have have you know baggage or they're they're super critical and there's all kinds and, and really that's not just our church. Paul describes that in 1 Corinthians 14. He talks about the, that same tension there. That you want the gifts of the spirit, you want faith operating, but at the same time you're trying to bring some kind of uh, context to it as well and so that's always a challenge it is for our corporate gatherings it is for our individual life when God calls you to do something it will often challenge that part of you where you go uh you know this this won't make sense to others it doesn't even make sense to me I love these this verse here we walk by faith not by sight that's King James same same verse different translation under the message it says it's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going I thought that was a great, great way to approach that. You know, in other words, we don't see it. It doesn't even make sense, but we're moving on it because we, we know in our knower. You know who Elijah Otis is? He's the, and he almost, 
all the elevators you go into, you'll see it says Otis Elevator. That's because he didn't actually create the elevator. He, cre he was a machinist back in the 1800s. He created the braking system because back up until that time, elevators were only used for hauling grain because the rope, the, the, the cable always broke. And so nobody would, would step into one because they would, you know, plummet to their death. He created a braking system, and when it, when it go, would go a certain speed, the brakes would kick in. You might not know that, because cables don't break a whole lot nowadays, right? And I'm thankful for that, right? I'm, I don't want to test out Otis's brakes, you know. But people, even though he created them, nobody believed him. And so he would, he would have demonstrations where he would get in the elevator, or he'd actually get on the top of the elevator, go up several, several flights. Everybody, a big crowd would be waiting down below and up on top. And then he would take this big old ax and just, just cut the rope. And everybody would gasp as he would start to plummet. And then, of course, the brakes would kick in. He was never nervous. He knew, he knew, he knew the brakes were going to kick in. That is a great illustration of what faith is like. Everybody's looking at it going, that's so dumb. Goodbye, you know. <laughs> Hope it works out. And you know God is in this. And so I am sure-footed, and I'll even stake my reputation on this. Faith is also expecting the best. You're trusting that good things will come out of it, that God loves you. You know, people had those same questions back in Jesus's day that's why Jesus said hey even it's think of the best parent you can think of God's better than them in fact in comparison they're evil he goes God is if you ask for an egg he's not going to give you a scorpion if you're if you're hungry he's not going to like give you poison he's God cares for you he's a love and so when we have faith we're operating believing God has good things for us so according to your faith it'll be done unto you and so you expect God to come through, and you also expect him to come through with a good solution. Now, it might not be the one we would have come up with, because God has a, a bigger agenda, a bigger perspective, but you're going into it believing, hey, it's like, you know, a, an optimist with faith goes after Moby Dick in a robo and brings the tartar sauce. They're like, a fish is coming home. I don't know if it's Moby Dick, but I'm coming home with a fish. You know, that's all there is to it. And when we need a healing, you need God to move on your behalf. You pray with that level of fervency. We're told that in Hebrews to pray with a confidence, with a boldness, because you are not just throwing out haphazard prayers, hoping one will stick. But you have, you're locked into a relationship with the Heavenly Father. You're praying the promises of God. And you're knowing that God's going to do something. He's going to do something big. Number five. Faith is waiting for the answer. Well, all of us have prayed. Nearly all of us. And you know in prayer that many times there's a delay, right? It's, it's not immediate. It's not like you pray and, you, and the phone rings. Oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, I mean, that can happen, but generally there is a delay. And how you respond to that delay is an act of faith. I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry and delivered me. So the patiently learning patience, trusting God is going to do something, but there's a delay. And in that delay, it's, there's a temptation to get discouraged, like to give up. Well, I might as well not pray for that anymore. Sometimes it's what I like to do is in my prayer um, list, prayer journal, is I like to, when somebody gives me something to pray for, or I want to pray for something, I write the date I begin to pray that. Because sometimes it's not as long as I thought. You know, I think, I've been praying forever about that. I look back, actually, it's only been three months. Hmm. <laughs> maybe I could grow in patience a little bit, you know. That's in it. Maybe add that to my prayer list, Lord, grow, grow me in patience. Because there's a tendency for us to kind of get anxious, and, and then we just, ah, I'm not going to pray. It's not worth my time. The way I like to look at it is, is there's some things that, that are, some things are, you know, need a fair amount of prayer. I don't always know how much prayer is needed. 
So I'm like, every time I pray, it's like one of those scales, you know, it's like, you know, it's, there's a rock on this side. I've got my little prayer cup here and I'm adding prayer and eventually, boom, it'll, it'll transfer over. And so I just keep, I just keep making deposits. I keep making deposits. You know, long, a great illustration of, of, of patience in the Bible is the Israelites that were enslaved for 400 years. That's, that's, a, that's a delay, I think, in all of our book, right? 400 years. I mean, that passed on generations. Then when Moses came on the scene, he, he spent 40 years in Pharaoh's court, 40 years out on the desert. You know, I mean, there's a continued delay. And then eventually, that was a great miracle. Releasing an entire country, an entire people group that were enslaved and into freedom. But what do you, how you respond during the waiting is very important. And, and what you do is, is you make sure and you follow God's instructions. You do what God says. You know, in, in, in Hebrews 11, God's hall of fame, so to speak, Abraham, is, his obedience, the Bible says, is credited to him as as righteousness because he was operating in faith. It wasn't, it wasn't out of logic. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't even know where he was going. God comes to him in Genesis, says, hey, I want you to go and, and, and somewhere. And he goes, where? He goes, well, I'll let you know when you're there. Well, how, how long is it going to take? Uh, you don't need to know that. You know, what's, what do I need to bring? Just pretty much everything, yeah. Just, you might not be back. It doesn't look promising. Pack up. And then he's got to tell his, 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 his family that, you know, and that's kind of, hey, you know. And he was, he was already in retirement. You know, he's 70 when he's being called to, to do something that big. So when you're waiting you're obedient. Gideon is another great example of that. If you know the story of Gideon in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Gideon is, you know, he's up against the Midianites. They have 10,000 soldiers that are out to kill him and harass him, all kinds of t terrible stuff. And God has him just get 300 people. He had more than that. But he whittles it down to 300. He says, put your swords away, get, you know, a torch, a pot to cover the torch, a trumpet, that's not your standard warfare gear. <laughs> and then they surround the Midianites. They kind of sp they were down in a, in a valley, and they took the high ground all around. And then on Gideon's cue, they, they had all lit their torch already. They smashed their, the, this, this pot that was covering it, and just the commotion and blew their trumpets and the light and all. They ended up killing each other. So it's kind of an amazing, well, it is an amazing story. That the, the, but what's even more amazing is that Gideon followed the instructions. Like, oh, yeah, that'll work. Yeah. yeah. I've read the Art of War. It's in there, you know. No, it's not in there. I mean, this is something, you know, like just trusting God. God, I'm going to do what you say to do. Trust in the Lord and do not lean on your own understanding which is what we tend to do. And faith often pulls at that. You know, you've got your own understanding, your own way of doing things, things that make sense to you. And then sometimes God's way is not like that. Seven, faith is being persistent. You don't give up. You keep working. You keep at it. You keep praying. Well, Noah is a great example of that. Noah in Genesis 5 through 9. If you know that story, it had never rained up till that point. The, 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 uh, the way the world and the earth worked at that point, it had never rained. And so he's in the middle of a desert building this huge boat. And everybody's looking at him, Noah, you're a crackpot, man. What is your problem? I mean, how is this even going to work? He didn't have the answers to that. You know, and then he's, his, his family sucked up into that. You know, his kids go to school. Your, your dad's pretty weird, you know. That's, you know, it's odd, you know. But he perseveres in it because he stayed in the game. He stayed in it. Of course, they lived longer back then as well. So he, they work on it for 120 years. 
I mean, you get a gold watch after that, I hope, you know. It's just, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a long time of just staying in there, staying in the, in the game, saying, I'm going to trust God uh, that he's going to come through for me. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You don't give in. And that becomes a challenge, right? Because you wonder, well, what if this isn't God anymore? Generally, unless it's explicitly not in Scripture, like spoken against in Scripture, in my experience, now this is not everybody, but generally, hanging in there is the better option. Across the board, in your marriage, in your job, in a relationship, in a friendship, with your kids, hanging it, just, just keeping on is generally the, the, the default. Because God blesses that. And he wants to grow us in this area of perseverance. And then number eight, faith is rebounding from failure. Now everybody makes mistakes. This may surprise you, but I'm not perfect. I've made poor leadership calls. I've made poor parenting decisions. I've, I've not been, uh, I've made poor uh, husband decisions. I've, I've made poor, you know, uh, ad- I'm a, my, my, both my parents are still alive. I, I make poor decisions regarding that. And I mean, we make mistakes, right? So we, we're, we're always getting back up, trying to recover, trying to brush ourselves off, get, get our headspace back and be back in the game. But that's a big part of that is rebounding from failure. John Maxwell, if, you, if you're familiar with him, he's a, one of the leadership uh, He's written many books on leadership. He talks about when you fall, don't get up too quick. Think about it when you're laying there. Like, how did I get here again? Because you're less likely to end up there again if you pause. And you go, hey, but but you do get up. You want to get up. You want to learn something from that. And the biggest thing to learn from failure is failure is never final unless you allow it to be. It never defines you unless you allow it to define you. And sometimes our situations look pretty dismal and dark and discouraging. But you, if you have faith in God, a little faith in a big God, and you step into that, say, God, I'm going to trust that you can change my circumstance. It'll change. Love this verse. God says, forget the former things. In other words, You don't dwell on that. You don't just keep focused. You don't get consumed with that. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Out of barrenness, God creates productivity, fruitfulness. Out of failure and frustration, God creates freedom and blessing and all of us, all of us. I mean, we, most of us were pretty good at putting on a good face. And sometimes people get shocked when I start talking about my own failures, but I'm just, I don't think there's any profit. I know, I, I know how to protect myself when people are going to hurt me. But if I can't trust my church family, uh, I, then I'm going to live in a life of isolation. And, and somebody still could hurt me, but it's worth the risk for me. It's worth the risk. I never want to be so jaded, so hardened and, 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 and suspicious of people that I'm just super closed and don't open up. I think that having a transparent community of faith, and we protect that value. I've been talking about that the last few weeks. We, we, we cherish that, but we also protect that. The value of being transparent, of being open, sharing, being, there's a certain level of vulnerability that, that promotes community. And we want that. Here's last thing. Faith can do anything God can do. And Jesus says, you get to choose. You choose what he does in your life. Let's bow our heads and pray. Oh Lord, I invite you into this space whether people are joining online, wherever they're at. Lord, I know that you're bigger than these four walls. And so I invite you right now into the place where we're at. 
Some of us, we don't have a lot of faith. Probably most of us. But that's okay. It's all about what we put our faith in. And so why not pray a prayer where you say, God, increase my faith. Increase my trust in you. Because you say, I get to choose. You say, God, I want more faith for my business, for my family, for me, for a breakthrough, for my church. I need that. Some of you need a miracle. God does miracles, and he does it through people who pray. There's an intentionality to this. You go to God in prayer. You go, God, and maybe you feel like you've been praying for a long time and you've not seen anything, any breakthrough. The scale hasn't tipped to your side. You keep praying. Say, God, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for this again. Increase my faith. Maybe you're just here and you're struggling or you're watching online. You're struggling with this whole concept of believing. See, God, I, I just, man, I am stuck in unbelief. How do I get out of where I'm at? Well, it begins by you taking the initiative and praying a prayer of faith where you say yes to God. And I want to pray with you if you're here and you feel distant from God, you feel like your prayers aren't really making a difference, maybe you're far from God, and you want to you get connected to God again, then I want to invite you. I want to lead you in a prayer to help you take that step. And if you would, right where you're at, with all, I just ask everybody to bow their heads, close their eyes, give each person space. But I'm going to ask you, if you want to pray, to have God come into your life, grow your faith, then I want to pray with you. And I want you to let me know about it right where you're at. Just put your hand up and say, I want to pray with you, Andy. Okay, bless you. Bless you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yep. Okay, I see some hands on, on to the side, in the back, on the side over here. Okay, you can, oh, in the back, several in the back. Put your hands down. Pray this prayer. Say, God, help me to stop thinking of myself. Help me to not just see who I am, but my potential. Because you said it's according to my faith. You say, God, it begins with honesty. And I have a hard time believing. And I ask you to help me to believe. Help me to trust. Would you say, God, give me a breakthrough quickly, a miracle today or this week to kind of the injection of faith. I need that, Lord. If you've never asked Christ into your life, you need to do that right now. Say, dear God, today I want to invite the Spirit of Christ into my heart, into my life, to guide me, to direct me. Forgive me, God, for trying to do things, for trying to live a life without faith. I don't want to do it anymore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, would you congratulate those who...